So our guest was a monk for 20 years, and now he teaches philosophy, world religion, fairy tales, and art. So welcome to the podcast, Mr. Sean Kramer. We're excited to have you. Okay, thank you. We, at least you have part of me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Next time we're gonna have uh, we're gonna have your face and your beard and all. <laughs> um. I'm still excited. We get to hear your story, though, uh, Mr. Kramer. We were really excited about it, and um, it seems like you have a lot of really good information to share. Um. Okay. And what? Uh, uh, I hope you kept people busy for a while while we were having trouble, and you did a meditation and. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, and what would you like to start with? Um, well, if I may, I would. I, w I was going to ask you about the um, being a monk for for twenty years. I was interested in how how that came to be. How did you become a monk, and what was your experience like? Okay, it, uh, when I was in college in California, Ojai, California. A monk came to visit uh, the college where I was, and he belonged to a community in Europe that was, their intention was to try to start a community of humans who had the intention of consciously forming a, one community of humans and angels. And so I was very uh, taken by that idea. I was very, already very drawn to the angels. So uh, I went to Europe, uh, first Portugal, then Brazil, and I was part of this, uh, that community. And so that was how I got there, how it started. That was the first, I was in different communities after that. In, uh, United States, different monasteries, but at first I was with this community of that was very focused on the angels. Did you did you ever happen to go to the one in Mount Shasta? Mount Shasta? No, I don't know um, about which that that was a, a monastery or I I believe it was uh, me and my. Well, I had a crew of about three other people with me, um, just about four hippies tra traveling in a in a hippie van, um, and we we ended up pulling into this. I, I'm pretty sure it was called the monastery, but um, they said that they weren't open, and they told us to come back uh, like sometime after Christmas, I, I think. But um, yeah, I was just curious about that. And what what really what really drew you to start seeking more about about the angels? Um, it's, that's, yeah, what was it? It was an interior thing. I mean, I knew, um, as I learned about the angels, I felt when I was young, I can't remember what it first was, but I would, um, have these times or experiences where I would uh, just be somewhere walking or in some, and just stop and feel like there was this connection with another realm. And then as I learned about the angels, um, it seemed like that was, the, you know, kind of giving words to that some of these experiences that I that were really without words or concepts and uh, so then when I heard about a community that was really trying to live with the angels uh, that was very attractive to me <laughs> and how, how did this community communicate with the angels or interact Oh, there was, well, they had, it was started by a woman uh, who had had died just before I joined, but she was, um, they called her mother Gabriella, and she had uh, visions of angels, 
and a lot of writings and information about angels, the world of angels. So they were very inspired by her and her writings and her information about the angels. And some of the practices were, they had what they called consecration to angels, making a kind of a ritual contract or promise or vow with the angels, um, opening ourselves to the angels. So they, one of their teachings, uh, which I believe is that a lot of our openness to the angels comes from our will and intention. You know, it's on a spiritual level. So if we will to open ourselves to the angels, then we are open to the angels. Um, as if, as if when, when we talk to each other right now, we're using words. And if I don't, if I just sit here and don't talk, then you don't know what's going on or what I'm thinking. But if I send out these words to you, then through those you have some signs to know what are my thoughts and intentions. But if we didn't have words, if we were beings that didn't use words and sound, how would we communicate? And um, perhaps it's just by our intention. So if it was just mind to mind, if we were having a kind of a mind to mind connection right now, uh, it would be just kind of turning our minds, opening our minds to each other, and then you would know what I'm thinking and feeling and I would know what you are. Mm. So that was a main part of the practice was on that level of um, trying to shift ourselves and practice opening ourselves to the angels and receiving their communications um, with beings that don't function through words or even through, uh, it seems, through images or, or concepts, so um, I think they can use them for our sake because we, you know, need those, but um, maybe we don't, so um, that was part of the practice. So by making these ritual uh, kind of agreements with the angels as a way of um, really opening our intention, our mind, our will to the angels. And then after that, practicing. So um, there are some teachings about the angels that the angels, each angel is extremely distinct, more distinct than we are from each other. So we're, we're all humans. Um, but we have this word angels that um, doesn't really name a kind of thing. It's all these other beings that are, um, that we can communicate with us. It means messengers. They're all these spiritual messengers. So each one would be very unique. So the mode of communication will be very unique. So part of the practice is learning that um, way of communicating with the, a certain particular angel, which is a whole different kind of being than another angel. Hmm. Um, you can think of one example, like if we, since we don't normally, you know, most of us really see angels, and if we could actually suddenly experience an angel, we might be surprised and say, oh my gosh, that's what an angel is. You know, I have these ideas, like, wow, now I really see it. And then, then we meet another angel and we go, oh my gosh, and what is that? Hmm. And it'd be, oh, well, that's another angel. Oh, well, that's like a totally different thing. And each one would be like, whoa, and what in the world is that? Well, that's another angel. <laughs> so 
so um, you know, working with the angels is we think in a very general way because we have one word. But since each one is so different, um, working with that angel will be very unique, and we might have to adjust ourselves, um, you know, to other angels. If that um, does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, we were all just checking out your one of your blogs, the uh, Sean Kramer One dot blogspot, and right now, okay. right now we're all looking at the picture that says that's titled "Angel Messenger of He Who Is." Okay. Um, could you s explain a little bit about about this picture? Uh, sure. The so I put the in Hebrew. Uh, that's what it says in Hebrew. Um, the messenger, which is the word for angel in Hebrew, Malak, of uh, he who is. So the in the uh, Jewish Bible, the it has a story of Moses on the mountain. Uh, meeting God, the divine being, and asking his name. And the divine being says that his name is the one who is. Just who, the one who is. So the, um, so the painting is the angel who is mediating for us that kind of infinite being that is like just total existence. So I put, uh, it's holding a symbol that is a symbol of the universe. Um, I combined kind of a Christian and Egyptian symbolism there. And in the symbol, it's a circle or a sphere with um, one cross, which is the vertical. It looks two-dimensional, but it's supposed to be like a three-dimensional sphere. Yeah. So one, one cross is the four directions that we're on, the plane of existence that we're on. And then the vertical is the axis of the whole universe. And at the top is a little circle, which stands for the sun, the spiritual sun of the whole universe. Um, so it's the picture of our plane, and at the center we can access the vertical ray, and the spiritual ray that connects us and allows us to move to different levels. And that's the work of the angels, so the wings are symbols of the power of the angels, the spirits, to um, lift us through different levels and dimensions, through kind of the vertical axis of the universe. Um, that's kind of their, one of their abilities or roles with us, to uplift us. Um, yeah, okay. <laughs> How long did uh, how long how long did you work on that painting for? Oh, uh, I painted that uh, some days, maybe a week. Right. Beautiful. The actual painting, maybe well, maybe a little. Cause it's all wood. So I had to prepare the board, and so maybe a week or two on the, the actual art of it. Yeah. It's 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 absolutely yeah. beautiful. He asked well, thank about, you. It is definitely. Um, he asked about one of the paintings that he he kind of favorited. What was your favorite piece that you've done, or what was your favorite um, thing to work on or work with? Oh well, I guess a recent one that is one of my favorites. It's on my other blog. There's, you can connect to it through this blog. 
Um, and there's a painting called Chapel Perilous. Right. I don't know if you're able to find that one. We just it's on, it's on my Heraclidian blog. They, they both link to each other. Okay. Okay. What was the title of it again? Chapel Perilous. It has someone meditating oh, of some architecture. Okay. Yeah. It's loading. Mm -hmm. And um, while he gets I got the, it, there we go. Um, and can you just tell us a little bit about that one or why it's your favorite or maybe even a little about the medium you used? Sure. Uh, it's, uh, so it, there's a, a lot of some of my own ideas. So it's in egg tempera, which is a medium in which you have to make your own paint as you work. So I mix materials that there I can, um, I mix up materials, I grind up stones, earth, some I buy ground up and mix them with egg yolk and which that's what adheres them to the panel that I prepare. And uh, so it's made with all, you know, natural rocks, really, earth that make the colors. And I apply it in a number of thin layers. So any part section you look at or any color, if you saw it in the actual painting, um, it might have 10, 20, even 60 thin, like fairly transparent layers of color to end up with the one color on it. So. Once I did all the drawing and laid out all the parts, um, each little part or section or object had quite a few layers over it. That's awesome. Um, it's definitely got a very beautiful color scheme, and um, a couple people in our chat really said that that's some of their favorites and that they, they really love this piece. So. It's definitely one of those pieces that gives a, a viewer an instant reaction. And that's mm. amazing about an, any piece of art. Yeah, it, it took a, a lot of work to get it to where I felt like the colors came together. There were a lot of stages where, you know, it, it like wasn't quite working to me. And that was the layers kind of shift the colors. So I was kind of going over the different parts until I felt like, um, they seem to work together. Yeah. Uh, it has a... Uh, the figure is meditating in this place, which is something like a chapel, but I wanted it to be like a chapel, but also strange in a way, not in a way unlike a regular chapel. <laughs> and and he's, the figure is meditating, and there's a bird on its head, which is eating the brain of the meditator, uh, which can, and it's supposed to look like, in a way, kind of an unpleasant, frightening thing, but ultimately is a good thing. The first thing that came to mind to me for that is I have a, a set of oracle cards in the, the card called the mental conflict. It almost represents the same thing perfectly, where it's like a man and he's got that almost 90 degree angle chunk out of his head so that his brain can can pretty much leak out. And I think even the meaning to that card, it tells people they need to meditate on a mental conflict. And it's got a tree growing out of his head instead of a bird. So I instantly recognized it. And it's kind of cool that you've got the same meaning flowing through that. Yeah, that's interesting. I would like to uh, look at that and see that card. For sure. Um, but yeah, yeah it, I, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say egg tempera, um, when I went to art school, it was definitely one of the hardest mediums that I had to practice with, and I never actually got it down. So for you to have a piece completely done in so much detail in that medium, that's just amazing to my brain, especially. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, people say that. I, um, I actually think it's 
different. Yeah, I don't, in itself, yeah, people say it's hard. I, I, uh, maybe we could work together. I could show you it's not so hard. (laughs) That would be amazing. Um, would you say that's one of your favorite mediums to work with, or do you have a favorite medium? Uh, it is. I like, I like some of the, like, ancient mediums. I like fresco, egg tempera. I like the mediums that, uh, use like nat- natural materials are very connected with the natural materials of the earth uh, and that are more hands on. So I like to work with and make my own paint so I know where they're coming from and, and use. Like I think of art as and images as showing us what the world is meant to be. So, so by using the natural materials, like as if we're revealing what they really are. And yeah, that's a, okay. I can see that card. Wow. Oh, you're oh yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, we showed it, and I was going to email it to you if you weren't watching. But yeah, that card, like that's instantly the card I thought of when I saw saw your painting because it's got like that same kind of chunk out of his um, mm-hmm. out of his head, and there's a tree growing outside of his head. And when I saw the bird, I was thinking, oh, the bird's perched on the tree and just waiting to peck out his head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think of it as the experiences that we can go through in life and in our journey that um, seem frightening, like we're losing our mind, but that are actually good. So we might be hesitant to, you know, have a chunk of our mind, you know, get taken away or eaten or you know lost or leak out or something so that's why i took the idea of chapel perilous which is a actually goes back to the legends of king arthur but it's that it's perilous to go forward but it's perilous not to go forward so but actually the growth comes from from actually going forward. So, you know, we have to risk it. Like when we're kind of losing our mind or our certitude, um, we don't know really what's gonna happen. So true. But if we wanna if we try to hang on, well we won't, you know, move through that experience. Um I'm just curious on a, an artist level, are, are your pieces very large? Are they small or about like how big are, are these pieces that we were just looking at? Uh, those ones aren't very large, maybe. So I'll work, my pieces, my larger pieces will be like 27 inches or so. Those would be less, you know, maybe. 18 inches. Awesome. Those are still pretty decent size. Um, sometimes I just, I, I like to give our viewers an idea because when you're on a computer screen, you never you never know. And sometimes it's just as amazing to see that much detail on a piece that's like five by seven versus a piece that's five foot by seven. So yeah. uh-huh. um, just nice right. to ask and check and see the, about what size the, the artist likes to work in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I enjoy both. Uh, working large and small, they're different. Yeah. Okay. I saw a picture on uh, the first blog that uh, you were teaching 7th and 8th graders. Uh, it, you said you were a teacher, and you're, you're a teacher at the New Hampshire uh, Institute of Art? Correct, yes. I'm just uh, having to move a little, but I can keep talking. Okay. I went. I went to the library to get um, reception. I was and uh, 
it's been a good work time since I'm moving a little. But yes, I teach two days a week at the New Hampshire Institute of Art in Manchester, New Hampshire, and I have a studio in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. So for two days, I drive to Manchester and teach. So this semester, I'm teaching a course at the Art Institute on fairy tales for mm. the students. I would like to know more about this. Me too. Pardon? Uh, could you uh, go in a little bit more detail or more in depth about uh, what uh, what you teach when you say fairy tales? Okay. It's uh, so we. It's in some way it's a course on symbol and symbolism. Uh, dreams, fairy tales are very much like dreams. So we will read and discuss a lot of fairy tales, uh, like the Grimm's fairy tales, um, fairy tales that people are familiar with, but sometimes in um, more popularized versions, like from Walt Disney or something. But we'll go back and read some of the fairy tales and discuss them, you know, and go into the symbolism and compare fairy tale with myth, with dreams, and uh, yeah, talk a lot about imagery and symbols. That sounds really awesome, and I'm glad you're um, teaching. I, I believe you said young, like the younger generation. Uh, so I saw seventh and eighth, gra eighth graders. Uh, that's one of age group. So I, I teach both. So at the Art Institute, that's a, a college level for a Bachelor of Arts degree. And I also do um, at uh, just on, uh, sometimes I do, I also do with the seventh and eighth graders in town where I live, we paint icons, so I actually teach them egg tempera and they do their own painting with natural materials and uh, yeah, so there they will paint uh, an icon of the face of Jesus and they all do their own so there are some images um, yeah, I, I put at least one of the students' paintings, one of the girls, I think, did a very nice um, painting of the face of Jesus that I put on my blog. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. We're looking at a, a picture of four people, uh, two male and two female, and they're all holding up, holding up a... Depiction of Jesus? Well, I think two of them are Jesus, and maybe two are Mary. Okay, yeah, that was a workshop from a workshop I did. They came to my studio, and and each did a, uh, a painting, and I put an egg tempera. Um, so they, they each picked um, which image they wanted to do. And uh, I helped them, show them the technique, but they all painted it themselves. Thanks. Uh, we, we do have a question from one of the members in the audience. Um, yeah, the question from the audience. They, they were wondering what the difference between religious myths and fairy tales is, or perhaps if there is a difference. Uh, religious myths and fairy tales, did you say? Yeah, that's how they worded the question. Uh, yes, that's a good question. I, and there are a number of differences. So one difference um, that I think is important and interesting difference is that in the myths, they tend to be about... Um, our relationship with higher beings and higher ideals. 
to, uh, for example, a, in a religious, like in the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and they were given a test uh, from eating of the tree of good and knowledge, and they failed the test and got passed out of the Garden of Eden. That's common to religious myths, is they human beings face kind of a extreme demand, which they often either fail or they ascend to another level. So in the story of Jesus, he ascended up into heaven or in the Buddha story, the Buddha transcends. He, he faces something very difficult to test. And when he succeeds, he transcends, kind of leaves this world. So the religious myths uh, tend to be about humans either failing to live up to very high ideals or living up to them and becoming kind of gods or divine figures. Whereas in the fairy tales, the fairy tales are about more ordinary humans who go through uh, difficulties, conflicts in life, and often fail. And when they succeed, it's not about becoming divinized or going into another realm, but um, growing in this realm. So, an example, uh, say with Hansel and Gretel, uh, they go into the forest and go through these difficulties, meet a witch, suffer, they come out of the forest, but they don't go into nirvana or heaven or some other world, but they just grow up in this world. So the fairy tales are, um, in a way, more forgiving. They don't, people don't get cast out of paradise kind of forever or or like Prometheus, you know, have their uh, insides eaten every day over and over because they disobeyed the God. Uh, so that's one difference, that the myths are about how humans fail to live up to their high ideals or or in some way live up to them and become kind of divine. The fairy tales are about more our ordinary experiences, but they're told symbolically. And they're about growing in this world, in this life, not leaving this world. That's it. So that would be a partially a third. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I was just going to say that's a very, like, amazingly... I don't know, a very elaborated answer to that, because to me, I, I couldn't think of anything when they asked the question, so I was excited for your answer. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, we, we have a few more questions, too. Okay, good. One is from Re, and Re asks, what inspires your art? Okay. In my art, um, I, I do strive in my art to work with the angels. I feel like the angels uh, want to and do give us images that um, help us, that are, lead, are kind of images that are important for our human evolution and transformation. Uh, I believe that's the main part of the work of angels is they are both kind of pushing and leading us humans in our evolution. And part of it is giving us these images that help us in that. And so I, I hope to be open to those images that um, are part of that work. So, um, but the, the images, I would like to make images that um, help us humans 
means to uh, connect with both the angels and our own um, process of transformation and evolution, where we're going. And so I feel like as artists that if we do art with the angels, the angels can help us uh, in realizing bringing those images into this world that uh, will help both us as artists and people, humans who see them to awaken to and have images that help this this development that uh, you know, we're involved in and that, uh, that we're really striving for. Yeah. Cool. That's awesome. Um, another question uh, from Samantha. Yeah, she wanted to know if you held seminars, or um, let me see, I just lost it. If you hold seminars or classes or anything in places other than New New Hampshire or NH, is that where you're at? Yeah, New Hampshire. <laughs> uh, yes, I do. I have. I don't have any scheduled right now. But I have gone, I've done them in Colorado. I have a concert in Colorado. We arranged one there. Uh, so, yeah, I don't have any schedule, but I would be, uh, I enjoy going to other places. So, yeah. if there was some um, interest and I made some connections, that I would love to do that. Maryland. Yeah, come come visit us here. We would love to have you. <laughs> that, okay, I, I would be in Maryland. Okay, yeah, that would be great. Maybe we could uh, work something out. I would love to do that. Yeah, that'd be awesome. That. We're actually coming up your way in a couple of weeks, too. So yeah. that's pretty awesome. You're not too far. Um, another oh, question we oh. had. What was that? Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, we had a, <laughs> sorry. It, sometimes it's hard for me to, to hear when the, the phone's still going. Um, mm -hmm. A question from one of our viewers, David Diamondheart. He says, what inspires you about the Sri Yantra? And I love that shape. It seems so diff very different than your Christian-themed angel archetype works. Did I say uh, that Yes, I think of the Sri Yantra as one of the great images given to us uh, by the angels, give it to humans. Yeah, it comes, uh, comes from India. And it's a picture, as I see it, of, of the whole universe. So when we look at it, we get an image that helps us kind of intuit the whole cosmos together as it is coming out of the divine source and returning back into. So it gives a picture, an image of both the whole cosmos in its spatial dimension and its temporal process the picture. So yes, yeah, so I think of it as one of the great kind of images that have been given to us uh, from the spiritual world. And I do have, I'm very interested in and open to um, in all the great traditions of religion and wisdom. I studied with some Russian icon painters, and that's where I learned icon painting. So I do do those, but I also do, uh, and, and am inspired by um, a lot of other art, especially Asian art, Hindu, Buddhist art, Chinese art. Hmm. Yeah, your paintings are absolutely gorgeous, and it's very inspiring. Just looking at all the all the stuff that you're doing and everything you're teaching, and uh, we definitely are gonna have to bring you on again to talk about some of the some of the very deep uh, uh, topics that you that you do and cover and work with. I love the, your description and explanation of angels and how you worked with them and came about them. That's one of my uh, favorite topics to cover, especially with the podcast. So um, anytime that you would be interested in coming back to join us, we would love to have you. Okay. Well, well thank you. I would, I would love to do that. And when you're coming up, are you coming to New Hampshire? 
or nearby? Yeah, we're actually going to be visiting one of our other our other guests up towards New Hampshire here sometime towards the beginning of February. So yeah, that'll be be awesome. We'll have to connect with you about that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Good. Be yeah, good. and I would love to. Uh, yeah, talk about angels and art and imagery. Yeah, uh, I think uh, it's really something a characteristic of our time is human becoming more consciously united with the angel. Do you have a favorite angel that you work with or have connected with over your experiences? Um, I do. And I, there's one of them which I, I named or the angel helped me name it. I call it Shafia, and that's an angel. Maybe someone has also had connected with that angel. But it actually means, it's an Aramaic word that means clarity or luminosity. Hmm. That's awesome. Um, yeah. I like that you named one we haven't, we haven't heard of yet. In yeah. We're doing a lot of research on different angels, so that's that's beautiful. I'll have to look definitely more into that one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. This is so beautiful. Um, yeah, if any of you out there want to check out uh, Sean Kramer's um, blogs, both of them up are up on his profile here at projectbringmylife.com. Otherwise, uh, you can go to seankramer1.blogspot.com, and you can find uh, his other blog, directly from that blog. So, um, Sean, is there anything else that you wanted to uh, shout out real quick before we uh, let you go on this podcast? Oh, I, yeah, I just, I'm, I'm very happy for the connection. And yes, yeah, so I'd like to encourage and be part of fellow human beings connecting with a higher intention and purpose, I think uh, that's you know, a really uh, important thing uh, for our times. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, I feel somebody that you would connect very well with is David Diamondheart, and he also has his profile up here on our website, so you should definitely check him out. His artwork's pretty pretty on the spot as well. Oh, great. Okay, I will. And definitely, if you, with all your useful information, if you have time, if you wanted to hop on our forums, I'm sure that any information you have would help educate any, any of the viewers and just really just help get you out there since you're interested in communicating. And we are just beyond blessed that you, you kind of found us, and we are glad that we got you on. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, well, uh, Sean Kramer, you have a beautiful night, and we'll be in touch for sure. Okay, very good. Bless you. Yeah, bless, bless you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.